Okay, so this time what we're going to discuss is about chapter 6, no? Foundation of Intelligence, no? Database, business intelligence rather, and information management. So after completing this chapter or modules, no? Uh, you should be able to, to answer the following question. So what are the problems of managing data resources in the traditional file environment? And how are they solved by a database management system? What are the major capabilities of database system? Uh, and why is a relational database is so powerful? What are some important principles of database design? And what are the principal tools and technologies for assessing information from databases to improve business performance and <clears throat> decision making? What are the information policy, data administration, and data quality assurance essential for managing the firms and data resources? <clears throat> Right now, no users receive reliable, timely, and pertinent information via an efficient information system. <clears throat> so information that is accurate is error-free. No? So when information is accessible to decision makers at the appropriate time, it is timely. So when information is applicable and suitable for the task and choice that call for it, it is said to be relevant. So it may come as a shock to you to find that a lot of firms lack timely accurate or pertinent information <clears throat> because their information systems data has not been properly managed and maintained data management is crucial because of this no and uh, our presenter examine how information system organize data in a computer files and conventional file management techniques to better comprehend the issue uh, to give us more details about the topic let us all welcome our presenter go ahead Good afternoon, classmates. In this chapter, we will be discussing about foundations of business intelligence, databases, information management. I am Jamie Bautista, and I will be discussing the first two parts of the chapter, which is organizing data in a traditional file environment and the database approach to data management. The next two parts will be discussed by Hanifrey Guerrero. In this report, or this part, we will learn or describe how the problems of managing data resources in a traditional file environment and how are they solved by a database management system. We will also be learning about the major capabilities of database management systems and why is a relational DBMS so powerful? We will also apply important principles of database design. So let's start in organizing data in a traditional file environment. An effective information system provides users with accurate, timely, and relevant information. Accurate information is free of errors. Information is timely when it is available to decision makers when it is needed. Information is relevant when it is useful and appropriate for the types of work and decisions that require it. You might be surprised to learn that many businesses don't have timely, accurate, and rele relevant information because the data in their information systems have been poorly organized and maintained. That's why data management is so essential. To understand the problem, let's look at how information systems arrange data in computer files and traditional methods of file management. So a computer system organizes data in a hierarchy that starts with a bits and bytes and progresses to fields, records, files, and databases. A bit represents the smallest unit of a data a computer can handle. A group of bits called a byte represents a single character, which can be a letter, a number, or another symbol. A group of, grouping of characters into a word, a group of words, or a complete number, such as a person's name or age, is called a field. A group of related fields, such as a student's name, the course taken, the date, and the grade, comprises a record. A group of records of the same type is called a file. For example, in our illustration, um, the records 
in this illustration could consti constitute a student course file. A group of related files makes up a database. The student course file illustrated could be grouped with files on students, personal histories, and financial backgrounds to create a student database. A record describes an entity. An entity is a person, place, thing, or event, or event on which we store and maintain information. Each characteristic or quality describing a particular entity is called an attribute. For example, student IT, course, trade, and grade are attributes of the entity course. The specific values that these attributes can have are found in the fields of the record describing the entity course. In most organizations, systems tended to grow independently without a company-wide plan. Accounting, finance, manufacturing, human resources, and sales and marketing all develop their own systems and data files. The use of traditional approach to file processing encourages each functional area in a corporation to develop specialized application. Each application requires a unique data file that is likely to be a subset of the master file. These subsets of the master file lead to data redundancy and inconsistency, processing, inflexibility, and wasted storage resources. In our illustrations, the traditional approach to information processing. Each application, of course, required its own files and its own computer program to operate. For example, the human resources functional area might have a personal master file, a payroll file, a medical insurance file, a pension file, a mailing list file, and so forth, until tens, perhaps hundreds of files and programs existed. In the company as a whole, this process led to multiple master files created, maintained, and operated by separate divisions or departments. As this process goes on five or ten years, the organization is saddled with hundreds of programs and applications that are very difficult to maintain and manage. The resulting problems are the data redundancy and inconsistency, program data dependence in the flexibility, poor data security, and an inability to share data among applications. Now, let's uh, discuss about the problems with the traditional file environment. First is the data redundancy. It is the presence of duplicate data in multiple data files so that the same data are stored in more than one place or location. The data redundancy occurs when the Different groups in an organization independently collect the same piece of data and store it independently of each other. Data redundancy wastes storage resources and also leads to data inconsistency, where the same attribute may have different values. For example, in, in this in instance of the course illustrated in our 6.1 illustration a while ago, the date may be updated in some systems but not in the others. The same attribute, student ID, may also have different names in different systems throughout the organization. Some systems might use student ID and others might use just the ID, for example. We also have the next problem, which is the program data dependence. This refers to the coupling of data stored in files and the specific programs required to update and maintain the, those files such that changes in programs require changes to the data. Every traditional computer program has to describe the location and nature of the data with which it works. In a traditional file environment, any change in a software program could require a change in the data accessed by that program. One program might be modified from a five-digit to a nine-digit zip code. If the original data file were changed from five-digit to nine-digit zip codes, then other programs that require the five-digit zip code would no longer work properly. Such changes could cost millions of dollars to implement properly. 
na exists lack of flexibility. A traditional file system can deliver a routine scheduled reports after extensive programming efforts, but it cannot deliver ad hoc reports or respond to unanticipated information requirements in a timely fashion. The information required by an ad hoc request is somewhere in the system but may be too expensive to retrieve. Several programmers might have to work for weeks to put together the required data items in a new file. Next is the poor security. Because there is a little control or management of data, access to end to and dissemination of information may be out of control. Management may have no way of knowing who is accessing or even making changes to the organization's data. Last but not the least, the lack of data sharing and availability. Because pieces of information in different files and different parts of the organization cannot be related to one another, it is virtually impossible for information to be shared or accessed in a timely manner. Information cannot flow freely across the different functional areas or different parts of the organizations. If users find different values of the same piece of information in two different systems, they may not want to use these systems because they cannot trust the accuracy of their data. Now let's move to the database approach to data management. Please note that database technology cuts through many of the problems of traditional file organization. A more rigorous def definition of a database is a collection of data organized to, to serve many applications efficiently by centralizing the data and controlling redundant data. Rather than storing data in a separate files for each application, data appears to users as being stored in only one location. A single database services multiple applications, for example, instead of a corporation storing employee data in a separate information system and separate files for personnel, payroll, and benefits, the corporation could create a single common human resource database. A database management system, or the DBMS, is software that permits an organization to centralize data, manage them efficiently, and provide access to the stored data by application programs. The DBMS acts as an interface between application programs and the physical data files. When the application program calls for a data item, such as gross pay, the DBMS finds this item in the database and, and presents it to the application program. Using traditional data files, the program would have to specify the size and format of its data element used in the program and then tell the computer where they were located. The DBMS relieves the programmer or end user from the task of understanding where and how the data are actually stored by separating the logical and physical views of the data. The logical view presents data as they would be perceived by end users or business specialists, whereas the physical view shows how data are actually organized and structured on physical storage media. The database management software makes the physical database available for different logical views required by users. For example, for the human resources database illustrated, in our screen, a benefits specialist might require a view consisting of the employee's name, social security number, and health insurance coverage. A payroll department member might need data such as the employee's name, social security number, gross pay, and net pay. The data for all these views are stored in a single database where they can be more easily managed by the organization. So how a DBMS solves the problems of the traditional file environment? A DBMS reduces data redundancy and inconsistency by minimizing isolated files in which the same data are repeated. The DBMS may not enable the organization to eliminate data redundancy entirely, but it can help control redundancy. 
even if the organization maintains some redundant data using a DBMS eliminates data inconsistency, can help the organization ensure that every occurrence of redundant data has the same values. The DBMS uncoupled programs and data enabling the data to stand on their own. Access and availability of information will be increased and program development and maintenance costs reduced because users and programmers can perform ad hoc queries of data in the database. The DBMS enables the organization to centrally manage data, their use and security. So we have here the relational DBMS. Contemporary DBMS use different database models to keep track of entities, attributes, and relations, relationships. The most popular type of DBMS today for PCs, as well as for larger computers and mainframes in the relational DB, is the relational DBMS. Relational databases represent data as two-dimensional tables called relations or files. Tables may be referred to as files. Each table contains data on an entity and its attributes. Microsoft Access is a relational DBMS for desktop systems, whereas DB2 Oracle Database and Microsoft SQL Server are relational DBMS for large mainframes and mid-range computers. MySQL is a popular open source DBMS and Oracle Database Lite is a DBMS for mobile computing devices. Let's look how a relational database organizes data about supplier and parts. So let's see this, a relational database tables. The database has a separate table for the entity supplier and a table for the entity part. Each table consists of a grid of columns and rows of data. Each individual element of data for each entity is stored as a separate field, and its field represents an attribute for the, that entity. Fields in a relational database are also called columns. For the entity supplier, the supplier identification number, name, street, city, state, and zip code are stored as separate fields within the supplier table, and each field represents an attribute for the entity supplier. The actual information about the single supplier that resides in a table is called a row. Rows are commonly referred to as records or an in, in very technical terms as tuples. Data for the entity part have their own separate table. The field for supplier number in the supplier table uniquely identifies each record so that the record can be retrieved, updated, or sorted. It is also called a field, key field. Each table in a relational database has one field that is designated as its primary key. This key field is a unique identifier for all the information in any row of the table, and this primary key cannot be duplicated. Supplier number is the primary key for the supplier table and part number. So here. Note that supplier number appears in both supplier and part tables. In the supplier table, supplier number is the primary key when the field supplier number appears in the part table. It is, a called, it is called a foreign key and is essentially a lookup field to look up data about the supplier of a specific part. So a relational database organizes data in the form of two-dimensional tables. Illustrated here are tables for the entity supplier and part showing how they represent its entity and its attributes. Supplier number is a primary key for the supplier table and a foreign key for the part table. Relational database tables can be combined easily to deliver data required by users, provided that any two tables share a common data element. 
In a relational database, three basic operations as shown in the figures are used to develop useful sets of data, select, join, and project. The select operation creates a subset consisting of all records in the file that meets stated criteria. Select creates, in other words, a subset of rows that meet certain criteria. In our example, we want to select records from the part table where there, the part number equals 137 or 150. The join operation combines relational tables to provide the user with more information than is available in individual tables. In our example, we want to join the now, now shortened part table only will be presented and the supplier table into a single new table. The project operation creates a subset consisting of columns in a table, permitting the user to create new tables that contain only the information required. In our example, we want to extract from the new table only the following columns, part, number, the part name, the supplier number, and supplier name. So we also have the non-relational database, non-relational database management system, or the NO, no SQL, is any kind of database that doesn't use the data, the tables, fields, and column structure data concept from relational databases. Non-relational databases have been designed with the cloud in mind, making them great at horizontal scaling. So this uh, no SQL use more flexible data model and are designed for managing large data sets across many distributed machines and for easily scaling up or down. So our next topic is the capabilities of database management system. A DBMS includes capabilities and tools for organizing, managing, and accessing the data in the database. The most important are its data definition language, data dictionary, and data manipulation language. So data definition capability specifies structure of database content used to create tables and define characteristics field. Data dictionary is automated or manual file storing definitions of data elements and their characteristics. Data manipulation language used to add, change, delete, retrieve data from database. In querying and reporting, DBMS includes tools for accessing and manipulating information in databases. Most DBMS have specialized language called a data manipulation language that is used to add change, delete, and retrieve the data in the database. This language contains commands that permit end users, end users and programming specialists to extract data from the database to satisfy information requests and develop applications. The most prominent data manipulation language today is Structured Query Language, or SQL. In Microsoft Access, you will find features that enable users to create queries by identifying the tables and fields they want and the results and then selecting the rows from database that meet particular criteria. These actions, in turn, are translated into SQL demands. So a DBMS includes capabilities and tools for organizing, managing, and accessing data in the database. So here is uh, our example of access data dictionary features. A data dictionary is an automated or manual file that stores definition of data elements and their characteristics. So you can find here the supplier number, and you can already find the data type, 
and everything and other details. So Microsoft Access has a rudimentary data dictionary capability that displays information about the size, format, and other characteristics of its field in a database. Displayed here is information maintained in the supplier table. The small key icon to the left of supplier number indicates that it is a key field. So this one is the example of an SQL query. Illustrated here are the SQL statements for a query to select suppliers for parts 137 or 150. They produce a list with the same results as figure 6.5. So next is the example of an access query. So illustrated here is how the query in figure 6.7 would be constructed using Microsoft Access Query Building Tools. It shows the tables, fields, and selection criteria used for the query. Microsoft Access and other DBMS includes capabilities for report generation so that the data of interest can be displayed in a more structured and polished format than would be possible just by querying. Crystal Reports is a popular report generator for large corporate DBMS, although it can also be used with Access. Access also has capabilities for developing desktop system applications. This includes tools for creating data entry screens, reports, and developing the logic for processing transactions. So now let's move to designing databases. To create database, you must understand the relationship among the data, the type of data that will be maintained in the database, how the data will be used, and how the organization will need to change to manage data for a company-wide perspective. The database requires both a conceptual design and a physical design. The conceptual or logical design of a database is an abstract model of the database from a business perspective, whereas the physical design shows how the database is actually arranged on the direct storage devices. So now let's move to normalization of entity relationship diagrams. The conceptual database design describes how the data elements in the database are to be grouped. The design process identifies relationships among data elements and the most efficient way of grouping data elements together to meet business information requirements. The process also identifies redundant data elements and the groupings of data elements required for specific application programs. Groups of data are organized, refined, and streamlined until an all overall logical view of the relationships among all the data in the data database emerges. To use a relational database model effectively, complex groupings of data must be streamlined to minimize redundant data elements and awkward many-to-many -many relationships. The process of creating small, stable, yet flexible and adaptive data structures from complex group of data is called normalization. Now let's see the figure 6.9 and 6.10 illustration. In the particular business model here, an order can have more than one part but each part is provided by only one supplier. If we build a relation called order with all the fields in included here, we would have to repeat the name and address of the supplier for every part on the or order even though the order is for the parts from a single supplier. This relationship contains what are, what are called repeating data groups because there can be many parts on a single order to a given supplier. A more efficient way to arrange the data is to break down order into smaller relations, each of which describes a single entity. If we go step by step and normalize the relation order, we emerge with the relations illustrated in the 6.10. So, 
in an unnormalized relation for order, relation contains repeating groups. For example, there can be many parts and suppliers for each order. There is only one-to-one -one correspondence between order number and order date. Unlike uh, the after normalization, the original relation order has been broken down into four smaller relations. The relation order is left with only two attributes and the relation line item has combined or concatenated key consisting of order number and part number. Relational database system try to enforce referential integrity rules to ensure that relationships between coupled tables remain consistent. When one table has a foreign key that points to another table, you may not add a record to that table with the foreign key unless there is corresponding record in the linked table. Database designers document their data model with an entity relationship diagram. So this is an example of an entity relationship diagram. This diagram illustrates the relationship between the entities, supplier, part, line item, and order. The boxes represent entities. The lines connecting the boxes represent relationships. And a line connecting two entities that ends in two short marks designated a one-to-one -one relationship. A line connecting Two entities that ends with a cross foot top by a short mark indicates a one to many relationship. So, this diagram shows the relationship between the entities, supplier, to part line, item, and order that might be used to model the data. So, that's all for. The first two parts of the chapter. Thank you, Paul, for listening. Hi, Dean. Hi, classmates. Good afternoon. I will be discussing the part two of chapter six. What would be our agenda for today? First, we will be having our objective. Then we will discuss the first part, which is the use of databases to improve business performance and decision making through the challenge of big data, business intelligence, infra infrastructure, analytical tools, the databases, and the web. After which, we will be discussing the last topic of Chapter 6, which is the managing of data source that comprises of establishing an information policy and ensuring data quality. So let's go now on our objective. The aim of our discussion is to discuss and understand the use of databases to improve business performance and decision making. The second one is to estab establish and analyze the principal tools and technologies for accessing information from databases to improve business performance and decision making. And lastly, to identify the importance of information policy, data administration, and data quality assurance, which are essential for managing data sources. So let's go now into the first part, which is using databases to improve business performance and decision making. Transaction details are monitored by businesses using databases, and these databases are helpful 
to every company because it provides information that will run the business efficiently and help the management to make better decisions. The data is stored in the databases would give enlightenment to the questions that the management is seeking, like which product is the best seller or which month that has the highest gross sales. So with this, the first to consider in using databases to improve performance and decision making is the challenge of big data. Data that are being collected by most companies easily fit into rows and columns of relational database management systems or DBMS. However, due to evolving technology, data have exploded from web traffic, electronic messages, and content on the social media. This data may be semi-structured or unstructured, and with this, it is not suitable for relational database products wherein columns and rows are organized. Big data do not focus on the specific data quantity, but refers to the data ranges from petabyte to exabyte, which is from billions to trillions of records from all data sources. Big data are created in huge quantities as compared to traditional data. For example, a single jet engine has the ability to generate 10 terabytes of data in just 30 minutes. And each day, there are 25,000 airline flights. So just imagine the data being generated by a single jet engine. The next one is the business intelligence infrastructure. Assuming an analyst wanted to have a concise, reliable information about the current operation of the business, the trend analysis of data, and changes across the entire company. The data that the analyst will use might have to be collected together coming from various systems such as sales, inventory, accounting, and external sources for competitor data or others. So with this, the analyst must use big data and a contemporary infrastructure for business intelligence that has various tools for obtaining useful information. These tools and capabilities include data warehouses and the data marts. We also have the Hadoop, in-memory computing, and analytical platforms. The first one is the data warehouse and the data mart. Data warehouses store data that are current and with a historical trend that could be potentially useful to the management in their decision making. The data is coming from many operational systems like sales, customer details, supplier details, web transactions, and many others. The data warehouse will extract the data from the operational systems and combine to external sources and transform by correcting incomplete details or wrong mapping and will restructure the data for management reporting and analysis before it is loaded into the data warehouse. So this is the ETL process as previously discussed. On the other hand, Data Mart is a subset of data warehouse in which a summarized or highly focused portion of the company's data is placed in a separate database for a specific population of users. So as seen in the diagram, Data Warehouse is like a one set of database containing the different data from different system or departments like data from sales department, marketing department, human resource department, and legal department. The next one is the Hadoop, which is used by companies in handling data that are unstructured and semi-structured in huge quantities. So this is an open source software framework managed by a software foundation that enables distributed parallel processing of huge amounts of data across inexpensive computers. Hadoop is a Java-based programming framework that supports the processing and storage of extremely large sets in distributed computing environment. So it is usually divides the big data problem into sub problems and combines the data into a smaller data sets so that it can be easily analyzed. So we also have the in-memory computing. 
This is another way of handling big data analysis at it relies on the computer's main memory, which is the random access memory or RAM for data storage. So this processing makes huge data sets to reside entirely in a memory. Thus, the storage of the information in the main random access memory of a dedicated relational database operating on a comparatively slow disk drive. Lastly, we have the analytical platforms. This is a specialized high-speed platform that was developed by commercial database vendors by using both relational and non-relational technology. So that is optimized for analyzing huge data sets. These are pre-configured hardware software systems that are specifically designed for query processing and analytics. These also include in-memory systems and NoSQL non-relational database management systems. Some examples that are used in data analytics is Power BI and Tableau. To understand better the infrastructure of business intelligence, we have here the components of data warehouse. Temporary business intelligence infrastructure features capabilities and tools to manage and analyze large quantities and different types of data from multiple sources. Easy to use query and reporting tools for casual business users and more sophisticated analytical tool sets for power users are included. Current historical data are extracted from various operational systems along with machine-generated data, web data, unstructured audiovisual data, and data from external sources that's been processed, restructured, and reorganized for reporting and analysis. This data can be directly extracted, transformed, and loaded to data warehouse, as seen in our diagram. Then it can be subdivided into data mart and the users can access directly to the data warehouse or data mart if the user needs only specific data like sales or marketing. All users can directly access the data warehouse but if the user needs only specific data, then the user can access the data mart. It can also be processed using Hadoop clusters which serve as a staging that pre-processes big data prior to data loading in the data warehouse, data marts or analytic platform, or for direct querying by power users. Reports and dashboards are the main outputs and it includes query results. You will notice that the users can directly access to ad hoop cluster data warehouse analytic platform, but if the user needs to specify needs only a specific data, then the user will access through Data Mart. The details of various types of business intelligence users and reporting will be discussed by other reporters. So this is how it really looks like. The third database that is useful and improving the business performance and decision making is the analytical tool. Business intelligence technology is very useful in capturing and organizing the data and making it available for further analysis using various software for database querying and reporting as discussed in part one. In here, we will be focusing on the multidimensional data analysis or OLAP, data mining, text mining, and web mining. So these analytical tools are used in consolidating, analyzing, and providing access to, to vast amounts of data to help users and management make better business decisions. The first analytical tool is the multidimensional data analysis or online analytical processing or OLAP. Online analytical processing supports multidimensional data analysis, wherein it enables users to view the same data in multiple ways using various multiple dimensions. So to understand it better, let's take a look into the Rubik's Cube. This is a multidimensional view, wherein this view shows product versus region. 
So if you rotate the cube 90 degrees, the phase that will show is product versus actual and projected sales. But if you rotate again the cube 90 degrees again, then you will see region versus actual and projected sales. Other views are possible depending on the analysis to be made. So each side of the dimension represents different aspects of data and these are represented by the dimensions like the product, price, and projected sales. The second one is the data mining. So this is the process of extracting patterns from data. It is becoming an increasingly important tool to transform data into information. It is also commonly used in a wide range of profiling practices such as marketing, surveillance, fraud detection, and scientific discovery. It can also be used to uncover patterns in data, but is often carried out only on samples data. And the data mining process will be ineffective if the samples are not a good representation of the larger body of data. So here are the types of data information that is obtained from the data mining. First is the associations. These are occurrences that are linked to a single event, so like ticket sales of a concert tour. The second one is the sequence. These are occurrences that are linked over time, like sales from previous month to another month. We also have here classification. So in this one, it will examine existing items that have been classified through the recognition of patterns that describe the group to which an item belongs. So like the classification of sales, if this is related to food items, and it can be further classified to the different foods that are offered by the business. And the fourth one is the clustering. So this is the same as classification, but the only difference is there are no groups that are defined in clustering. And lastly, forecasting. So it, is, it uses data prediction in a different way. It usually uses existing data to forecast what other data will be. For instance, the current sales and prior period sales can be used to project the sales next month. The next one is text mining. Text mining tools have the ability to extract key elements from unstructured big data sets. It determines the patterns and data relationships and summarizes the data information to make it useful to the organization's management to make sound decision making. And the last one is the web mining. So it is the discovery and analysis of useful patterns and information from the World Wide Web. So this is usually used if the business likes to understand customers' behavior and to ev evaluate the effectiveness of website and so on. And this can be classified into web content mining, which mines content of web pages, web structure mining, which analyzes links to and from web pages, and web usage mining, which mines user interaction data recorded by the web server. And lastly, the databases and the web. Businesses are using the web to make internal information stored in the business database available to the customers and business partners. So this will help the customers and business partners decide on the items that they intend to select. So to understand the relationship of the databases, the web, and customers, let's take a look into the diagram. So a customer wants to buy something through the web. The user accesses the retailer's website over the internet using web browser software on his or her personal computer or uh, cell phone or laptop. The user's web browser software requests data from the organization's database using HTML commands to communicate with the web browser. The web browser then passes this request for data to software that translates HTML commands into SQL so that the commands can be processed by the DBMS working with the database. So in a client or server environment, the database management system resides on a dedicated computer called the database server. 
The database management system receives the SQL request and provides the required data. The middleware will transfer information from the organization's internal database back to the web server for delivery in the form of web page to the user. So based on the diagram, there are a number of advantages in using the web to access an organization's internal database. So first one is web browser software is much easier to use than proprietary query tools. And the second one is that web interface requires few or no changes to the internal database. It costs much less to add a data web interface in front of a legacy system than to redesign and rebuild the system to improve user access. The last part of Chapter 6 is the managing of data sources. Policies and procedures for data management are very crucial because this will ensure that the data shared with customers and business partners remain accurate, reliable with integrity, and always re readily available when needed to help in the decision making process of the data information users. So how do we manage data resources? First is by establishing an information policy. Information policy is needed in every organization, small, medium, or large. The data information shared with users is important and the organization doesn't want the user to use the data information in whatever the user wanted. Here are the key components when establishing an information policy. First is information policy. It specifies the organization's rules for sharing, disseminating, acquiring, standardizing, classifying, and inventorying information. The next one is data administration. So this one is responsible for managing the data, which is an organizational resource that is bound to specific policies and procedures for data security and data integrity. The next one is data governance. As promoted by IBM, it deals with the policies and processes for managing the availability, usability, integrity, and security of the data employed in a partnership enterprise with a special emphasis on promoting data privacy, data security, data quality, and compliance with government rules and regulations. Lastly, the database administration, which is a function that performs the defining and organizing the structure and content of the database. Once we establish the information policy, we need to ensure data quality. A well-designed database and information policy will go a long way towards ensuring that the business has the information it needs. However, additional steps must be taken to ensure that the data in organizational databases are accurate and remain reliable with maximum data integrity. So the first step is the data quality audit. So this is the first step in performing data quality analysis. The accuracy and level of completeness of the data in an information system are performed using structured data, wherein it is surveying the entire data files surveying samples from the data files or surveying the data users as to their perception of the data quality and data integrity. The next step is the data cleansing. This is also known as data scrubbing. It performs multiple activities to detect and correct data in a database that are redundant, incorrect, incomplete, and improperly formatted. This process will not only clean and correct the data, but it enforces consistency among different data sets that originated in multiple separate information systems. It is important to ensure data quality and integrity because inaccurate data, wherein it is untimely and inconsistent with other data source of information, may lead to the management's incorrect decision that might affect the business negatively, leading to financial losses. That's the end of chapter six, and we hope that you learned something new, and thank you for listening. Okay, so thank you very much no, for a well comprehensive discussions of chapter six. No? 
uh, again, uh, it is important no, for us to understand uh, the importance of this uh, discussion, no? especially the objective of having a database management. Uh, database and information management. No? <clears throat> Same as what we did, for example, in World City Colleges. No? We see it that we could be able to share data from one department to another. Let's say, for example, if you wanted to transact no, uh, in accounting office, no need for you to submit an additional form, additional folder. So all the data is stored in a server and uh, they could simply uh, get all the data in the server, as I mentioned, based on the given databases. No? So yung, yun yung pinaka-advantage. No? Kasi because the main idea of database is to, re to reduce the redundancy of data. No? Because... <clears throat> The presence of identical data in numerous data files resulting in the storage of the same data in multiple locations. So when various groups no, within an organization independently acquire the same piece of data and store it in separate locations, data redundancy occurs. No? Again, uh, we need to understand that data redundancy waste stores, uh, stores space and it can result in inconsistent data where several values may exist for the same property. No? So we have also what we call the program data dependence, no? lack of security, data availability sharing issues, and so on. So many of the issues with conventional file organizing are solved by database technology. No? A more precise, precise, of course, the database is a collection of data that, have, that has been centrally located in control, to effectively support several applications. <clears throat> data appears to users as being stored in just one area, as opposed to being separated into files for each program. Multiple applications can be supported by a single database, and a company or a school may, for instance, construct a single common human resource database rather than <clears throat> holding employee data and various information system and different files for people, payroll, and benefits. No? So <clears throat> by separating the logical and physical views of the data, so the DBMS frees no? the programmer or end user for having the comprehensive where or comprehend where and how the data are actually kept. No? The physical view, demonstrate, <clears throat> Uh, how data are actually arranged and structured on physical storage media as opposed to the logical view, which depicts data as they would be seen by end users or business specialists. No? So that's that how uh, important is the DBMS. No? And we, a while ago, we have we've heard about the relational database. No? <clears throat> Different database models are used by the modern database management system to maintain track of entities, properties, and relationship. Uh, okay, yun ang pinaka-main idea niya sa atin. Okay? And uh, if any two relational database tables share a common database, <coughs> it is simple to combine, <coughs> to provide users with the data they need. Na? So yun yung advantage kapag naka-relational yung database. So hindi mahihirapan yung ano natin, ating programmer or yung developer natin. So a while ago, no, it also discussed the normalization, <clears throat> database design, referential integrity, and so on. So I think that's it. Uh, an entity relationship diagram is very important. You want this to one, one to many, many to one, and many to many relationship. But <clears throat> we have also a big challenges no, in, in the data. No? Because the majority of data gathered by the company up until around five years ago, consisted of transaction data, which was simple to fit into the rows and columns no, of the relational database. Okay? And this data may be semi-structured or unstructured, making a relational database products that organize data into columns and rows inappropriate for this type of data. No? Yun yung tinatawag natin na big data. <clears throat> but we need to imagine, you need to succinct accurate information about the business present operation trends and changes. If you work for a major company, you could have to piece together the data you need from many systems, including sales, production, accounting, as well as the external sources like competition or demographic data. You might need to use big data more frequently. So a modern infrastructure for business intelligence comprises a wide range 
of tools for extracting information from the many data types utilized by businesses today, including enormous amount of semi-structured and unstructured big data. Okay? So I think that's it for this topic. So thank you to our uh, to all of our presenters and congratulations.